to Sususle in Namibia. Now Namibia gets its name from Nabib, which is big, wide, dry, open space. I don't know where they got that idea from. Vle is a dry pan like just here, but this is a beautiful, big, red desert. Now, the red sand, because deserts have sand, normally is created by rivers eroding against rocks or waves eroding against shells down on the coast. But this sand doesn't come from a river here or the coast here. Where this sand comes from, the geologists say, is the Kalahari Desert, which is thousands of kilometers that way. And what happens is the Kalahari sand gets washed down the Orange River. The Orange River feeds the Atlantic Ocean on the west coast of Africa and then it goes up the northbound currents, blows off the top of waves, and is deposited here. Now think how long it's got to take to move this volume of sand from the Kalahari Desert down the river and up the currents in the Atlantic Ocean. Makes you think. There's another thing that makes you think too. You look around here and you think the desert is lifeless, but it's not. The desert creates the most amazing different life forms that you get to see, like this the six eyed sand spider. It's called a six eyed sand spider because it's got six eyes and it lives in the sand. Anyway, that's not why it's famous. It's famous because it is the most venomous spider in the world. You don't want to be bitten by that little bugger. Other really interesting forms of life in the desert include the sidewinder snake. Now the sidewinder snake has its eyes on top of its head, not the side of its head. And the reason it does is it buries itself in the sand. Only the eyes are seen. You could look at sand and you can hardly see it till you zoom in and see the eyes or the little tongue comes out as it flicks because snakes smell with their tongue. By the way, the sense of smell gives you more of your taste than your tongue does. Ever thought about that? Anyway, the sidewinder snake gets its name because when you actually disturb it and it comes up out of the sand, it sidewinds and crawls up the side of sand dunes. There's also the two-horned adder, which is called that because it's got two horns. So the desert's a funny place. The more you look, the more you actually see some of the most incredible evolution of life. And one of the most incredible evolutions of life is metabolic water. Now, what's metabolic water, I hear you say? Well, many of the birds and other species in the desert can create water from their own metabolism. By eating their food, they convert the hydrogen and the oxygen and the food and the environment around them into the water. So many species of desert animals actually can go their entire life without drinking water. When they see water, they'll drink it, but they don't actually need to. But then there's this really unusual species that creates metabolic water that you might not have heard of. What species creates metabolic water? Us, humans. 
Some people can create up to three liters of water a day through the metabolic water process. Now, if you can create three liters of water a day, why do you die of thirst? And the answer is quite simply because we use more than three liters of water a day through sweat, through urine, but also drinking water flushes our system of toxins through the liver and through the kidneys. Those desert species that create metabolic water don't flush their system. So if you feed a desert bird peanuts and there's salt on the peanuts, the salt will build up inside that bird's system and ultimately kill it. So don't feed the birds peanuts. Anyway, when you go further north of the Sussesflay Desert, up around Swakopmund, that's where you see the death adder, that's where you see the two horned adder, that's where you see the sidewinder snake, but that's where you see the great big yellow sanded deserts, the more traditional desert if you like, jump in a four wheel drive and go for a wander or jump on a quad bike and have a bit of yippee fun. But when you do that, be careful of the desert and its environment and the species and the plant lives that you see because this has a lot more really incredibly evolved life in it than you give it credit for. That's why I love deserts. This is the Namibian desert. Oldest desert in the world, by the way. The geologists say it's up to 55 million years old. That's when they say this area first became arid. Up around Swakopmund in the yellow sanded desert, there's something you're going to notice about the sand dunes. The sand dunes are steep on one end and shallow on the other. The reason they are is the wind blows the sand up to an angle of about 11 degrees and slowly builds it up, pushing it further forward until it reaches 34 degrees. Now why 34 degrees? And I mean angle, not temperature, because at 34 degrees, the sand starts to flow. And this is how the sand dunes move. The wind blows the sand up that 11 degree slope. It gets to the top until it hits 34 degrees and it flows down. These sand dunes around Swakopmund can move up to two meters a year. Huge volumes of sand moving at two meters a year. Now it took the South Africans when they were ruling Namibia a long time to figure that out because they built a couple of train lines that kept getting swallowed by sand dunes. And there's a couple of really cool places where you can see where the train line has been laid, a nice little ridge, a nice flat place for the train line, completely swallowed by sand dunes because it's a living, moving beast. The desert. This part of the Namibian coast is known as the Skeleton Coast for things like this, lots of shipwrecks, etc. Now, this is a pretty remote part of the world and if your boat sank or your plane crashed or your car broke down, <coughs> you'd be in a lot of trouble. I'm walking through the petrified forest. It's over 100 million years old. There used to be about a kilometer worth of sediment sitting on top of here and the pressure of the sediment on old, large wetland forests put pressure on dead trees, turning those trees into fossilized rock. And then over the millions of years, that one kilometer of sediment eroded away to leave the petrified rocks and forest on the ground. Welcome to Swakopmund in Western Namibia. Now, Swakopmund is a lovely little seaside town about halfway up the west coast of Namibia that feels particularly Germanic. A lovely Germanic architecture and a lot of German tourists. And there's probably a good reason for that. It was colonized by the Germans. The Germans came in here in the mid 1800s, colonized it, and by all accounts were pretty rotten colonizers. They were responsible for the Herero genocide up in the north. Now, about 30 k's or 30 miles somewhere around about that to the south is Walvis Bay. Walvis Bay is a better port and was colonized by the Brits. So there's no German architecture there and it's pretty industrial. Given that the Brits were 30 miles that way and the Germans were here, you can imagine between the years 1914 and 1918, this is a pretty tough place to be during World War I. At the Treaty of Versailles, Germany lost all of her overseas colonies, including Southwest Africa, this one, which was given to the South Africans to be a mandated territory. And if the people thought it was bad under the Germans, well, it got worse under the South Africans because they brought in apartheid. But not only did they bring in apartheid, 
they got stuck into the Angolan civil war where the South Africans backed one side and the Cubans backed another and the northern Namibian tribes, the independence minded people were backed by the Cubans and the South Africans gave them a bit of a shellacking as well. By about 1975 the South Africans decided this colonisation stuff was not for them. They decided that Namibia should be incorporated into the Union of South Africa in a complete and whole part. The UN jumped up and down and said, uh uh, it's a mandated territory, it's supposed to become independent, not part of your country. So under some pressure, a peacekeeping force and an ongoing civil war, finally South Africa relented and gave the independence to Namibia in 1990. Today, it feels pretty good. You see an integration between the blacks and the whites, at least on the beaches and the public places, although the blacks tend to still live in the shanty towns and the whites still tend to live in the better parts of town. But it does feel like a well-functioning, good mid-level economy. The other indicator of great economic advancement in Swakopmund and Namibia, of course, is the toasted ham, cheese and tomato sandwich. One negative about Southwest Africa and Namibia in particular is the HIV epidemic. Wolvis Bay down the road, because it's a port and has a lot of semen coming in, pardon the pun, is uh, the home of HIV in Namibia. 24.8% of the adult population in Walvis Bay are said to be HIV positive. I'm not going to test that.